What's going on, y'all? KM Best here, your favorite 59th ranked Marvel snapper. After the nerfs to Thanos and the buffs to Angela, the metagame is wide open. Let's take a look at five decks plus a couple bonus decks to play with Angela and then to play in response to this resurgence of Angela in the new meta. Now, full disclosure, a lot of these decks are going to focus on Angela, and because they focus on Angela, these decks will also focus pretty heavily on Elsa, Bloodstone, and Hope Summers, as they are the best Angela synergy cards, and I think a lot of people at the top end of Infinite are just really happy to have Angela back. Now, Angela is a card that is a very powerful and dangerous one to release back into this game. I am still a little bit surprised that Second Dinner was able to do that. And this is sort of the baseline thing that I think they were thinking about when they released Angela back into the game. This is Silky Smooth, courtesy of Lambie Series. And Silky Smooth is a mid-range deck that is built around Angela and Craven as scaling threats and movable cards that not only are enabling your Angela to get prohibitively large, but also enabling your Craven to grow very large as well while avoiding getting Shang-Chi'd by your opponents. This is a deck that uses its ability to have cards move around to manipulate priority and figure out whether it wants to have priority or lose priority on the final turn of the game, as well as to generate power. One of the major things you're going to want to be looking for when you play a deck like this is you are going to want to think about how big your Angela is actually going to get. You're going to have to be thinking about that the entire game. It's very easy to tunnel vision on the Angela and say, oh, okay, I'm just going to keep playing everything into the Angela lane, and then you get Shang-Chi'd, and then you lose the game. And making sure that your Angela does not get overly large is actually a pretty key part of how you should go about dealing with this deck. Now, what we're really going through in this video are just all the different ways that you can use Angela, all the different shells that Angela goes in, but if you have a complaint, and I expect there will be people who do, about the fact that most of these need Hope Summers, and Elsa Bloodstone, I have a non-Angela deck that hit rank one towards the back end of the video. Don't worry, there's something in here for people who do not have Elsa Bloodstone. That deck does run Hope Summers, though. She's very good. Now, in terms of issues, I do worry that a deck like this is likely to end up vulnerable to decks that are heavier on tech cards like Shadow King, and more specifically, extremely vulnerable to Loki. Loki is another deck that can already play the same trifecta of cards. The Hope, Kitty, Angela, Elsa thing is already something they can do, and they have a very favorable matchup when they play the card Loki. They just get to play everything you're doing. My worry with Silky Smooth is that it ends up being an okay deck, a good deck even, but a deck that has matchup spreads similar to decks that are going to beat it in the mirror. And I think that is the long-term worry for this specifically. I also will note that Red Hulk is in this deck as just a very large card. There's a lot of people playing Hope Summers right now. Hope Summers is a card that makes you play off curve a decent amount of the time. Red Hulk is a great way to take advantage of that. Since you have your own Hope Summers, you can very often play Red Hulk and a very large Kitty Pride on the final turn of the game. That play pattern is quite important to how this deck is trying to work. One way to think about Red Hulk in this deck is he is sort of like the people's blob. He's a blob that this deck can actually afford to play. And I think this deck previously was playing stuff like Eliath to fill that role. Red Hulk can fill that role just winning a lane on his own, whether or not you have priority. And that does give him some legitimate value. If you don't want to play Red Hulk here, there is absolutely nothing wrong with replacing him with Magneto. Magneto is just very good. When you look at how the last deck is built to play out, you have this very straightforward, I'm going to invest in the move game plan type of thing. And I think typically one of the things that I've noticed Big Baby, a high elo grinder do, is eschew that entirely. Just be like, why would you play this Craven Silk crap? Why would you do that when you could be playing a mid-range deck with Miss Marvel in it, who is just going to be a lot better at doing what this deck is trying to do. One of the other sub-themes he's worked in here is the Professor X and Cannonball sub-theme. If you can fill up a lane, or even if you don't fill up a lane, if you Professor X the other lane, Cannonball is always killing the thing that it ends up sending out. That's a very, very powerful card that can absolutely just win lanes on its own as long as you have that Professor X lane locked down. And you have a lot of ways to stack a lot of power. Angela in this deck is built for getting as large as you possibly can and then Professor Xing before they can really deal with it in a meaningful way. That is how this card is able to impact this deck. 
This, I would basically think of, is a deck that sees what the previous deck is doing and is like, I bet I can beat that. And what it does is it gets rid of the move stuff, the, I guess you'd call it the more finicky parts of the previous deck, and replaces them with very powerful tech cards and Miss Marvel. So, Shadow King is a card that bears special mention here. He's insane right now. He's one of the absolute best cards in the game, and this being a deck that, because it has the ability to get rid of, you know, Craven and the things of, of that nature, you're not playing Craven in here anymore, you have room for a Shadow King. Heads up, that'll beat the Craven. In addition, you have room for a Loot Cage, which will protect you from the Shadow King. And so you end up in this spot where you end up being a, an Angela deck that is better at dealing with other Angela decks than any other Angela deck. You are also just an Angela deck that runs a 414 in the form of Miss Marvel. This is a deck that's very easily able to make sure Miss Marvel is always on, barring some really catastrophic things happening. This is a deck that is also a little bit more customizable than the move version of the deck. Now, why is that? It's because you have these open tech slots. You have traded the move package for tech cards. And that means that this version of the deck can customize itself to more metagames. Right now, I would say it's customized to beating other Angela decks. But it doesn't always have to be a Luke Cage Shadow King deck. It could be a Mobius deck. It could be a Rogue deck. This is effectively taking the bones of the Angela Hope strategy and saying, that's strong enough to carry me. I don't need this move stuff. And I think it's a very compelling way to take the archetype. This is a Shuri Kitty list built by Prodigy and Shocker of all Shockers, Shuri Enjoyer. Now, this is a deck that is built to optimize the specific package of, you know, it has the same core cards here, right? Kitty, Angela, you have Hope Summers, you have uh, Elsa Bloodstone, the same core conceit is happening here but it's building around a different additional package onto that, which is the Shuri one. What I find particularly compelling about this deck is that it gets rid of the dumb Red Skull stuff, which is just asking to get Shang-Chi'd, which is absolutely everywhere, asking to get Shadow King. You are only investing in stuff that is either going to be face down on turn six because you don't have priority or moving around the board, right? And I think that is a very compelling way to build this deck you have either an oppressively large uh, oppressively large kitty pride that gets copied into an oppressively large taskmaster or you have a giant red hulk that is face down alongside a kitty pride because again you are a hope summers deck like you get to be a deck that is able to play because of hope summers you can play like red hulk instead of red skull and that puts you in a much better situation most of the time now one thing to really think about or at least to notice here is that Red Hulk is going to be about as big as a Red Skull, and Hope makes it a little bit uh, just as playable without the downside. That's really important, right? Like, yes, there are going to be games where that doesn't happen, and you end up playing it on the final turn of the game, and it sucks, and that's sad. But in those games, maybe you have a Shuri Vision, and then you move the Vision somewhere, and then you play a Red Hulk, and that's still good enough. Now, the real question for this deck is, is this going to be one of the best ways to use this package? One thing that it doesn't have is a lot of real counterplay to anything else. It's going to be a deck that lives and dies by the ability to go taller than the things it's playing. So, for example, if it runs into Phoenix Force, if it runs into a really good discard draw, if it runs into a bunch of different decks where it's like, oh, well, they actually just went taller than me and I don't really have the ability to interact with them in a meaningful way, it's going to run into problems. Now, one thing it does have is an armor, and that means that you can use this to bait people into Shang-Chiing something and then beat their ass. You know how I know this? Is I lost eight cubes to that exact play against Shuri Enjoyer. That is the kind of thing that you're going to have to do to keep this deck in the running. I think it's a deck that rewards skilled play, but I also think it's a deck that of all of these decks is probably the easiest to pick up and just start winning with. This is a deck you can get a lot of stuff done with you notice i censored myself there i'm doing better about that hopefully and we have a couple of intricate plays but nothing too really too big the only time i really find myself second guessing when thinking about this is either on turn six like okay i think they're gonna shang me do i need to armor do i have priority how do i beat what they're gonna do to beat what i'm doing and when i'm trying to figure out exactly how to deal with with a deck that is going a little bit bigger than me or has the potential to go a little bit bigger than me. 
that stuff's a little bit worrying. Now, the armor also has some upside against at least one of those decks that can go bigger than you. That is, of course, Destroy. Being able to have a good snap into Destroy, just free rolling this armor, that is legitimately sick. I think this is a deck that's going to get a little bit worse if Shadow King picks up popularity. It's going to have to figure out how to get a loot cage in there, maybe, and that makes it really, like, you're really kind of tight on space here. I really don't know if it can afford that, but right now, as long as people are Shangin' and not Shadow Kingin', this deck's in a good spot. We had one day of Baron Zemo being a card that I actually liked in this deck, and then he immediately got replaced with Angela. This is, of course, Loki, and uh, yeah, it's exactly as good as you think it is. Honestly, if I had to guess, I would say this is my pick for instant best deck in the game. It seems extremely powerful to me. It is the one of these decks that I played the most of. It is also the one of these decks that I'll have footage on at the end of the video if you'd like to watch, because I genuinely do think it is the standout of all of these decks. This one is legitimately scary, and I think it's legitimately scary for two reasons. The first is it's probably the easiest Loki deck to play in a very long time, which means it might actually percolate downwards in a meaningful way, which we haven't seen happen with Loki yet. The second is Thanos was the main thing playing Mobius and Mobius, and a lot of decks when they're early in the metagame are not really willing to experiment with stuff like that because they're trying to figure out what their optimal cards are before adding tech. This means that right now, this deck is running around roughly unopposed. In addition, all of the plans in this deck just work so well together, it's kind of unbelievable. You have all of the options that you need accessible to you. You have the ability to make large Jeffs. You have the ability to get extra energy, which helps you with your Agent Coulson plays. You can cheat energy with Quinjet. You have location control in the form of Snow Guard. You have a bunch of cheating, incredibly powerful stuff in the form of Loki. The way I would consider this deck is a mid-range deck that beats other mid-range decks. And that is just a very valuable thing to have in your arsenal, knowing that if you go up against the Silky Smooth deck, if you go up against the Big Baby Groove deck, you're going to be in a situation where if you play the card Loki, you're just going to win. And you have this incredibly favored position that you're in just by queuing into those matchups like yes it's super losable if you don't get the card loki it's even losable if you do but you are favored and just knowing that you're favored in those spots is like really genuinely good now in addition there is one other i think important thing to understand about loki and i something i'm definitely worried about I worry that the mirrors get a little bit too heavy on Elsa Bloodstone, which is to say, when this deck was last a thing, when Elsa, of course, you know, cost two, then it was pretty ridiculous, right? But the main thing that mattered in Loki Mirrors was, did you get a copy of Elsa with the Loki? If you had two Elsas, it was basically impossible to lose the mirror. If your opponent had two Elsas, it was basically impossible to win. And I do worry that that dynamic, specifically, is what makes Loki so good at beating the other Elsa decks, and it's what makes the mirrors so much of a potential crapshoot. We'll have to see how that goes, but I do worry. I have some play pattern concerns with this list. I think this is the exact kind of deck that was so good last time when everyone really hated Loki. And it finally plays like that kind of deck, and the mirrors are finally just like that, where you're just like, oh my god, they got the Elsa. Or, oh my god, I got the Elsa! And it starts to make me wonder if that is a potential legitimate play pattern issue. We, we will have to see. This is a bounce list. And this bounce list is meant to be such a powerful, unique thing. It was crafted by Gnome. Gnome, uh, Gnome Plays. Uh, you can find him on Twitch at Gnome underscore Plays underscore. Uh, good player. I definitely trust his instincts. He was a bounce main Basically, maybe not a bounce main, but like a bounce connoisseur, let's say, before the Angela patch. This is already a deck he was playing. Now Angela is out and it is a much better deck. Of course, there's like very obvious synergies with Angela here. Like you are able to be uh, a deck that plays Beast and plays Angela. And you're able to be a deck that plays Bast and plays Angela. It's like, oh yeah, that, that's actually just really, really good. The weird thing I think that people will not be prepared for in this list is is Havoc and Hope Summers. And the way this deck is using Hope Summers is to enable you to be a Havoc gamer. Using Hope Summers to beef your energy back up and then have Havoc be a 2-8 or a 2-12 makes Havoc sort of a second Angela. He's worse and more conditional, but then you think about, okay, I actually just hit this Havoc with a Bast and now he's a 2-7 or a 2-11 or a 215, and suddenly he's just Red Hulk, right? And that kind of stuff is what makes Havoc compelling in this list. Hope Summer's opening up 
room for this list to grow taller is, I think, quite important. I am generally, or would generally consider myself, a fan of how this list is constructed. I think it's a solid thing to play. And interestingly enough, I think it could have a fairly reasonable Loki matchup because there's just so much air in it. I'm going back to remembering how to beat Loki back in the day, right? When Loki was the man. And one of the ways to do it was by playing these weird bounce decks where like they would just get a bunch of stuff that kind of sucked. And if they didn't get your hit monkey, you would just win on power. And that is sort of how this plays. And I think that there is going to be a reasonable use case for this in a world where Loki starts taking over the metagame for sure. Finally, my boy Yo Woody hit rank one with his brew, uh, Silver Surfer. We did a video on it about like a, a couple days ago, and he's since iterated. He's added a Sarah in there uh, and added a Mockingbird to go alongside Baron Zemo. The basic thing that's happening is you're using Brood, Absorbing Man, Baron Zemo to discount your Mockingbird, similar to how Baron Zemo was being used in my Zemoki deck. You'll notice there's no Angela here. I'm bringing this up because I knew people would be like, yo, KM, you're like, look at all these decks to play, and they all have Elsa and Kitty in them. And it's like, all right, look, I can give you one that I know is good. It hit rank one. This is a legit-ass deck. It does not have Elsa. It does not have Kitty. This is the one I put on there for the people who are going to be upset with me uh, for doing that. I really wish I didn't live in a world where people were, you know mad at me for that but I, I like i understand the marvel snap collection system is what it is I, I really do get it and so i wanted to say like you know it doesn't all have to be angela decks obviously this video is and was focused on angela because she's the new hotness she just came back out we're gonna figure out how to best use her and unfortunately the best way to use angela is of course with hope summers elsa bloodstone and kitty pride and that seems pretty set in stone and so all those Angela decks involved Hope, Elsa Kitty, and this one, you know, it's Hope, right? Like, you just, there's Hope in here, right? Like, you're, you're going to be fine. But I do think this is, like, a good deck for that. I won't be, I won't go so far as to say it's budget, but I will say that in the course of this video, I've pretty much covered every deck I've either played or played against in High Infinite at this point. And I think that is a really interesting thing because the Angela patch has or the Angela buff has really brought back out all of these decks that were just lying dormant without her. And now there's like five different Angela decks you can play. They're all built around the same pillar, but they aren't the same. And I think that's kind of a fascinating metagame to delve into. Obviously, when we get to the weekend, we're going to have my normal tier list that is going to talk about all the stuff you can talk about here. But I did want to get this out there because, frankly, I'm just really excited. This is a fun looking metagame. I do worry that like that I have some Loki questions, but hopefully we can keep those on the on the on the on the down low. Hopefully they won't hopefully I'll be wrong about them. I've got some Loki questions. I've got some Red Hulk questions. He does seem quite strong. But we will have to just sort of sit here and find out how good that stuff actually ends up being, how this stuff shakes out. For now, I mean, I'm kind of overjoyed. Uh Thanos is gone. Angela is back. It's honestly everything I could have asked for. And in all of this confusion, my boy Yo Woody hit rank one with a deck that does not play either Thanos or Loki or even the new buffed Angela, just playing Silver Surfer. So that is super cool to me. One of the things that really should stick out to you about this tier list is just how little answers many of these decks have to something like Phoenix Force. There is one Shadow King across all of these decks and not a lot of ability to actually get taller than either the Phoenix Force plan or the Nimrod into Boom Boom plan. This is legitimately a deck that I think is well positioned right now. Now, you can run into the Shuri stuff. You can get armored on. It can happen. There are things that these decks can do, but by and large, you're going to end up taller than a lot of them. You are going to be able to do that. And Phoenix Force is a great deck for dealing with stuff like Silky Smooth, for dealing with that kind of stuff. Now, I do think that right now, Phoenix Force is a little bit worse in all these matchups than it was previously. Previously, I would say these matchups were pretty close to free, but... Because of Hope Summers, Angela, and Red Hulk, there are going to be games where these decks can compete with you on points. That is a real thing now. I do think Phoenix Force got a little bit worse in these matchups in a general sense. The question I have is, did Phoenix Force get worse enough that it's now no longer worth playing? And I think that's the question I want to be answered. Because my instinct is, no, this is still going to beat people up. This is still going to beat people up, and you are still going to be in a situation a lot of the time 
most of the time when you're playing one of these mid-range decks that unless you get your specific things that either answer this or magically go taller, you're probably going to die. And I think that is still going to be compelling. Now, I will say Phoenix Force in this similar meta that we've had to this one previously did not make the cut. We'll have to see how it goes. Right now, as long as people are playing these sort of relatively unoptimized, relatively tech-free, relatively small versions of these mid-range Angela decks, I think there's a space for Phoenix Force to exist. All right, y'all, I hope you enjoyed that breakdown. We're gonna cut to some footage of me playing the Loki Angela deck because like, you, you know me, you know me at this point. If you're actually gonna be surprised at that, I don't even know why you're here at this point anymore. Uh, of course, I'm grateful that you are. Uh, for everyone who made it through this far in the video, I hope you enjoyed this sort of early look at the metagame. It is very Angela focused. And like on some level, I feel like I should maybe apologize for that, right? Because it's like when you build around Angela, you end up building around these, you know, it's a battle pass card. It's a series five card that those are the things to do to optimize Angela. But I can't fix that for you. And I'm sorry, but like I actually can't fix that. The best things to do with Angela are Kitty Hope and Elsa. I can't fix it. It's just true. And so when you look at the top end of the metagame, that's just kind of what's going to rise to the top here. So apologies to anyone who's looking for like a budget Angela deck. I really am sorry that I, I, I don't have that for you. I really am sorry. But uh, I hope that, you know, the Phoenix Force and the Silver Surfer show you that like it's not just all about this stuff. It's about the context those things create. And I think if you start thinking about how to beat those stuff in that context, you can actually find some success as well. Now, of course, Thank you so much for making it this far in the video. I've been Cam Best. You got the Cam Boost. You've been phenomenal. And I'll see you in the next one. Are Loki stocks up? I don't know. Okay, hear me out. I bet it's just better than what I have. I was right. I was right. It was just better than what I had. Cable first. Maybe. Maybe that was correct. I can see that. Get a Loki from Colson. Could you imagine? I'll just get their Loki off the cable. Oh, it's cool. I'll get their Loki off that game. Nah, I don't think he's going to have the chance. Should I go for it, chat? I don't think so. Here it comes, though. Elsa.
They low key for five. It's good. Sure. It's turn six out of seven, chat. Relax. He has bird. He just played the card Loki. He does not have the bird. What I'm worried about is, do I throw priority? There's no way he still has the bird, right? Like, am I am I fucking stupid? It's like totally whiffing it. There's no birds here. I have a plan. I think it's winnable. Duck Chang, let's go. Did not duck second Shang. Did win the other lane. Okay, I gotta admit, I didn't expect the two Shang line, but I knew there was at least one Shang coming in over here, right? Madge. All right. Nightcrawler. Oh, are they playing Silky Smooth? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's like Cerebro too. No, it's Silky Smooth. Okay. Oh, it's Loki with a Nightcrawler. You know what? That's also fun. Okay. They're Mobiusing me? All right, you know what? I don't get it.
Now I should lose Pryo here. Right. So how do I ever die? Armor? We did learn that lesson, that is true. I don't know. Yeah, that's an insane Colson. Not playing that is like, you know, haha, -ha, very funny. It's a good idea. I get it, you played around it, you, you did good, but uh, have you considered that you're dying anyway, right? Like, you know, even if you're doing the, like, super next level shit here, we're winning the other lanes. Like, basically, no matter what. It happens again. Fine. If that's how shit is meant to be, If it's meant to be, it'll be. I think I'd like to not get Gamma Lab here. I don't know when the last Alliance Spotlight Cache was. It's a good question. I wish I had an answer for you, I just don't. Unfit Parrot with a raid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Unfit Parrot. Not since November. Really? It's been six months since Eliath was in a cache? That seems crazy to me. Wow. That honestly feels unbelievable. I'm not going to lie. That feels unbelievable. That is wild. I'm just going to try to stack energy here and see if I can bullshit a way out of this game. Whoa. Too bad it's not going to be useful, isn't it? Jeez.
I was thinking that Legion Isle. It is cool. I can't argue. It's a cool play. Yeah, good thing I'm the better player. Oh, yeah, for sure. That's the lesson we've learned here. No question. You liked Thanos Gellion? I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed Thanos Gellion. Why no untap profile? Why would I want that? I already am like... I guess the best way to be describe it is like marginally uncomfortable with the way people treat me. I think if I had a bunch of nerds auditing my untapped profile, I'd probably just delete it. I just like... I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm already like ugh, a lot about how that stuff tends to go. I'll stay in this game. I kind of just want to see the strength of the Angela Hope engine. Yeah, I am definitely getting Hella, right? Don't even know if I'm still winning, though, not gonna lie. So this takes me from 16 to 21. Oh, left 100%. The question is basically this and this, right? Thank you, Danae. I appreciate your subscription. Thank you for your contributions to my war effort. Ah, uh, you know something? I don't like it. I don't like getting snapped here. I'm gonna stick in the game anyway. What am I, an idiot? Yes. You said that when I resubbed last stream. Holy shit, I really did. Wow, I am dumb. I'm about to get creamed. Oh, oh my god.
If I'm them, I shang left and play something big in another lane, which means I am going to uh, try to win the left lane through the shang. Let's go. Let's go. I have attempted to and succeeded. Winning the left lane through the shank. Yes. Do you play it yet? No, not really. The silence card does look kind of interesting, not going to lie. Eliath or X-23? I mean, that just depends on what you're interested in, right? Those are two very different cards. I'm proud of my boy Woody, for sure. Yo, that's a lot of cards they just drew. Let's see what happens. I already told him I'm proud. Loki stuff is feeling solid. We're trying to figure out, like, I, I, I only have enough time to play Loki mostly today. Got like about an hour left. Which means we should do a giveaway soon. Huzzah. Okay. Snowguard. Loki. Alright, okay. Okay, I mean, this is not my favorite thing ever. By which I mean, I'm very scared of what could happen here. It certainly doesn't seem incredible to me. But. We have. This move. This move, this move, and this move. And that's pretty much what we got going for us. It's kind of all we have. Vault, Quake, and win. How does that... Oh, Vault, Quake. How does that win me? Oh... But, like, they have a Kazar and a Dazzler there. I don't think that works. I don't think that works. What if we Rogue? Zemo doesn't get any cards. There's a Quinjet there. No, I think it's just this one, unfortunately. The rogue god. Look at the rogue god coming in hot here. Now, will it be enough? I really don't know. But look at the rogue god coming in hot. Now, if I had played that Baron Zemo, we would lose that game.
That's just accurate. That's just actual facts. What is your favorite card? I don't think I really have one. I feel like favorite card implies a lot of, you know, stuff that it kind of isn't. Dog, you are about to get so grooted. Look at the, look at how groat you are, you fool. You've been groat. Please don't say groat. They've been groat. I'll say it again. Groat. G-R-O-T, G-R-O-T-E, G-R-O-T-E, and Groto was his name -o. All right. Is Lady Deathstrike about to pop the fuck off? No, I shouldn't play the Lady D. I lied. I should play the Lady D. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> 